Hello everyone. Today in this session, we will discuss some key facts about this stress, like how exactly it is defined and what is its physical significance. We all used to sit on the bench during our classes in school and colleges. But have you ever wondered what is happening within the bench when we sit on them? Let us look at this phenomena more closely and try to understand. There are few external forces acting on the bench. Firstly, the weight of the students, say W1 and W2, will act in the downward direction. Self weight of the bench, say WB, acting in downward direction. Also, there are some reaction forces provided by the floor of the classroom in vertical upward directions, say R1, R2, R3 and R4. Bench will not deform when we sit on it. But look at the nature of these forces. They are all compressive in nature. And hence, under the action of these compressive forces, bench is retaining its shape. This means there must be something within the bench which keeps bench intact together without allowing it to deform. This something is nothing but the resistive forces which are induced within the bench when the external forces are applied. These resistive forces tries to counteract on the externally applied forces, thereby trying to keep body together up till certain limit. The distribution of these resistive forces within the body is defined by the stress. So, stress actually provides the information about how exactly the resistive forces are distributed within the body. Now the question is, why do we need to worry about distribution of resistive forces or stress? Okay. Imagine that you are learning in your classroom and suddenly elephant enters to your class and sit on one of the bench. What will happen? The bench will not be able to withstand the weight of the elephant and it will break. This is because the bench is designed for human being to use and not for the elephant. Bench would have retained its shape only if the stresses induced within the bench were within some permissible limit. This is the most important criteria to design any device, component or machine. That the induced stresses should not cross the permissible limit for their safer performance. So in order to design any device, it is mandatory to understand how exactly these induced stresses are defined and quantified. Imagine a three-dimensional body as shown in figure, which is acted upon by four different forces, say F1, F2, F3 and F4. Assume that under the action of these four different forces, the body is in equilibrium and does not experience any kind of deformation. All these forces are trying to pull the body, but the body remains intact together. This means there are resistive forces which are induced within the body which nullifies the effect of these external forces. In order to understand how exactly these resistive forces are defined, let us cut this body into two pieces using the plane perpendicular to z-axis and look at the induced resistive forces on the cross-section. It is seen that small small resistive forces are induced throughout the section. Now let us divide the entire cross-section into small small area elements with the area of delta A. Let us focus on one of the small area and look at the resistance offered by this small segment. Let us refer the small resistive force offered by the small element by delta F. Here delta Fx, delta Fy and delta Fz are the three components of delta F in three mutually perpendicular directions. Now divide delta Fz by delta A. Basically it will be some scalar number. Now again try to increase the number of partition and again calculate the same ratio. The number now you will get will change. Again, you increase the number of partitions and note down the value of this ratio. If you keep on doing this, you will see that the ratio of delta Fz to that of delta A will converge to a specific number. And this specific number is nothing but one of the stress component defined by sigma Zz. The convergence will only be observed when the number of partitions tend to infinity. With this, the area element will become smaller and smaller and hence delta A will tend to zero. 
So sigma zz is defined as the ratio of delta fz to that of delta a when the limit of delta a tends to zero. The first index refers to the plane on which the resistive force acts. Here the first index is z as the elemental area on which delta fz acts is perpendicular to the z axis. The second index refers to the direction along which the resistive force acts. Here the second index is z as the direction of delta fz is along z axis. Similarly, if we take the ratio of delta fx with that of area of the small element that is delta a, we get one more stress component that is sigma zx. Again the nomenclature is similar. As the plane of the elemental area is perpendicular to z axis and hence the first index is z, whereas direction of delta fx is along x axis and hence the second index is x. Exactly in the similar way, the ratio of delta fy to that of delta a will be termed as sigma zy. Force delta fz is acting normal to the plane of the element. And so the corresponding stress component that is sigma zz is termed as the normal stress. Whereas forces delta fx and delta fy are acting along the plane and hence their corresponding stress components are shear stress. Usually shear stresses are represented by the symbol tau and normal stresses are represented by the symbol sigma. So here sigma z is same as that of sigma zz, tau zx is similar to that of sigma zx and tau zy is same as that of sigma zy. So sigma z is the normal stress acting on z plane in z direction, tau zx is the shear stress acting on z plane along x direction and tau zy is the shear stress acting on the z plane along y direction. So we have seen that on a single plane there is one normal stress components and two shear stress components that are defined. Let us further examine this phenomena by taking some other planes. Let us cut the body through the plane which is perpendicular to the y axis and divide the section in infinite number of parts and observe one of the element. Again we will have three stress components defined on this element corresponding to three mutually perpendicular directions of the resistive forces over them. Now the plane in consideration is plane perpendicular to y axis. So we will have sigma y, tau yx and tau yz as the three stress components out of which sigma y is normal component and the other two are shear component. Now cut the body with the plane perpendicular to x axis. Again divide the section into small small area elements. Here let us focus on one of the small elemental area and you will realize that there are again three stress components defined on the area that is sigma x, tau xy and tau xz. So far we have seen that we have three stress components on each plane and there are three such planes. So total 9 components of stresses have to be specified in order to define the stress at a single point inside the body. Here one must raise a question that which quantity is stress, whether it is a scalar quantity or a vector quantity. The answer to this question is the stress is neither scalar nor a vector, rather it is a tensorial quantity which requires a magnitude, a direction and a plane on which it is acting. Specifically, it is a second order tensor. Hence, nine components of the stresses are represented collectively in a matrix form, usually known as a stress tensor. Here, the components in the first row, that is sigma x, tau xy, and tau xz, are the components acting on the plane perpendicular to x axis. Similarly, the stress components in the second row are the components acting on the plane perpendicular to y axis. And the component in the third row are the component acting on the z plane. If you look at the columns, you will realize that the components written in the first column are the components acting on different planes but along x direction. Similarly, second column contains components acting along y direction 
and third column contains components acting along z direction in search and arrangement all the components in the main diagonal of the stress tensor represents the normal stress whereas the other components represents the shear stresses let us take one very basic example here a rod of certain length is acted upon by the tensile load at both the ends of magnitude capital p let the cross sectional area of the rod be capital a now cut the rod using the plane perpendicular to z axis and analyze the stress distribution over the cross section 90% of the student usually say that normal stress induced within the rod is p by a which is an incorrect statement this p by a is not the stress at a point inside the rod but rather it indicates the averaged value of one of the stress component over the entire cross section that means p by a is just the cross sectionally averaged value of one of the stress component let us understand this more clearly over the cross section the stress tensor will have different values at the different locations now let us divide the entire cross section in capital n area elements and each element is represented by a number at each of these elements the stress tensor will have different values the external force capital p will be balanced by small small resistive forces acting in the z direction let us define the small small resistive forces by delta fz so summation of all this delta fz over the entire cross section will be equal to capital p we can represent all this delta fz by the product of sigma zz and delta a this comes from the definition of sigma zz so delta fz at location 1 is equals to sigma zz at 1 into delta a1 delta fz at 2 will be equals to sigma zz at 2 into delta a2 so on delta fz at the nth element equals to sigma zz at n into delta a at n now let us take the sum of all these small small elemental forces so we will get the total force fz total in vertical upward direction as discussed earlier fz total will be equals to capital p now we can replace the value of delta fz1 delta fz2 delta fz n from here and replacing in the same equation so we will get p equals to sigma zz of 1 into delta a1 plus sigma zz2 into delta a2 plus so on up to sigma zz n into delta an so now if you recall sigma zz was a stress component and it was only defined for number of elements tending to infinity so here as n tends to infinity delta a tends to 0 so basically p is summation of infinite number of elements and we can represent the summation by summation sign of summation of sigma zz of i into delta a of i well i is running from 1 to capital n and limit of n tends to infinity now this is how integration was defined that if we have summation of infinite parts we can convert that to integral and hence we can say that capital p is equals to the integral of sigma zz over the entire area now we have all learned in the calculus that if we want to define the average value of any continuous function over the entire area we can find it out using the ratio of its integral over the area divided by the area itself so here if we want to find the average value of sigma zz over the entire area that is exactly equals to the integration of sigma zz over the area divided by the capital a so from here we can say integral sigma zz into ta is equals to sigma zz average into a now we can replace this integral from equation number 1 and we can say that capital p now is equal to sigma zz average into a from this equation so now sigma zz average is nothing but exactly equals to p by a so p by a is not a stress value at a point but rather it is the cross sectionally averaged value of one of the stress component that is sigma z now you are aware that sigma zz and sigma z are both the same component it is just a nomenclature difference so we have we conclude that capital p by a is the cross sectionally averaged value of the one of the component sigma z over the entire area thanks for watching this video 
If you have any kind of doubt, you can post your questions in the comment section below. If you have liked this video, kindly hit the like button and subscribe our channel for more further videos. Thank you.